Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. So, Game of Thrones returned for its fourth season while the sensible among us were asleep at 2am because Sky Atlantic had cunningly synchronised with the premiere at 9pm HBO time to discourage illegal downloading among the very hardcore that have made the show the mainstream cult it is today. If you're behind, there's nothing I can say that won't be a spoiler. If you're up to speed, my full review of the episode lies elsewhere. Which is not to say Telly Alex is Game of Thrones free. This is, after all, a drama with 75 speaking parts. They show up everywhere. Look, it's bastard Prince Gendry in New Worlds on Channel 4. All right, the ex-Skins actor, aren't they all? Joe Dempsey, who's not alone among Thrones alumni in this follow-up to the excellent English Civil War miniseries The Devil's Whore. Here he is being schooled in the wicked ways of the Puritan settlers in New England by none other than the old bear, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. All right, the actor James Cosmo. Brotherhood, yet all of this new world is built on land stolen from the Red Man. My father is an honest man. He would not take land that he isn't entitled to. And who entitled him to enclose the Indian's land? The English king. And what Charles Stewart has given, so he shall take away. And on that day, young Americans like you must seize true liberty. Written with full-blooded educational value by Peter Flannery and Maxine Brandt, and crisply directed by former Skins director, aren't they all, Charles Martin. New Worlds picks up 20 years after the Devil's Hall, with Charles II, as played by Jeremy Northam, doing everything but actually twirl his moustache. Yet another petition. 16,000 signatures got up by Shaftesbury and the Whigs asking for me to recall Parliament. None of us shall ever want for arse cloths again. I've seen some snippy reviews about Flannery and Brandt's dialogue being dry and expositional, but I found it fruity and true, and there was plenty of oil-staged action in between. What's that famous line? He pulls a tomahawk, you pull a long-barreled flintlock firing musket. <laughs> Oh, one more Game of Thrones crossover. The traitor who has sold his soul to Rome and the Pope. Yes, Lord Balon Greyjoy. Oh, all right, the actor Patrick Malahide. History of a different sort was being made over on the Discovery Channel, the network's first ever scripted miniseries, Klondike. More maps, more exploration of far-off lands, more portentous strings. Do we not actually live in a post-Game of Thrones world? It may yet prove more influential than The Killing or The Office. Ridley Scott catches the eye among the dozen producers of the three-part four-and-a-half-hour Klondike, which retells the tale of the titular gold rush through two friends, hoping this time next year to be millionaires, both as it happens played by Brits. Two men with nothing in their pocket. But a head full of hope. On the left, Richard Madden. Can't think where I've seen him before. Oh yes, Game of Thrones. On the right, Augustus Prue, last seen in the village. Never mind the settlers in New Worlds, the British really are coming in terms of casting. We go over there, we steal their accents. It ain't nothing personal, it's just, just a game, that's all. That's how it is up here. I've seen nothing about this as a game. Well then, son, you don't know people. Up here, your mask is off. You're either getting or you're getting got. Ian Hart as the slippery con artist Soapy Smith, an actual figure from actual history, like a number of the principal characters in this wily adaptation of Canadian historian Charlotte Gray's highly praised account, Gold Diggers. Two august actors get the and before their name in the credits, and they make fine foes. Sam Shepherd as real Jesuit priest, Father Judge, and Tim Roth actually playing English, which is a relief after lie to me. I want to make a confession. Apologize for the leaks. You just bought the place. Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. Uh, what would you like to confess? Arson. Murder. When did you commit these acts? Well, I haven't yet. Disciples of Deadwood will find it too sanitised to be mentioned in the same breath as Deadwood, but I thought it well cast, better than any narrative drama thus far commissioned by the History Channel, and uniquely authentic, in that it's shot in the same country it's set in, Canada, if not the same province, as Alberta stands in for Yukon. 
Well, lack of day. That's a great day ad scratcher, ain't it? It reminded me of a gruelling, weather-beaten and brilliant film about the gold rush made by the unstoppably prolific British director Michael Winterbottom called The Claim, similarly shot in Alberta. His 2010 return to TV was The Trip, an award-winning meta-gastro travelogue improvised by Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon as they travelled no further than an itinerary of cosy Lakeland restaurants. It defied all expectations of lovey self-gratification by gratifying audiences too. For the second series, they've all had to suffer the hardship of a trip to Italy. If I were in a bar in a hotel in Britain, right, and I want to have a drink with a girl, I couldn't do it, because there would be an assumption, oh, what will she do? Go and chat to Rob Brydon. Yeah, people think I'm affable. And what, what, affable, that's what right. I'm you affable. Are, I'm affable. You are, I'm affable. Are, I'm affable. I'm not disagreeing I'm an affable man. I'm not disagreeing But my public persona is even more affable than I actually am. I'm not as affable as people You've think I am. You've made an affable rod for your own back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Series 2, in which Coogan and Bryden freeform semi-autobiographically over Porcini-stuffed quail, is even more indulgent than the first, as it's another six helpings of the same. I expect they have a self-reflexive thing to say about that. It's like trying to do a sequel, isn't it? It's never going to be as good as the first time. Godfather 2. Which is the one that people always mention when they try to search for an example of a, of a sequel that's as good as... Just when I thought I was out, they put me back in. I know I'm not alone when I say I could sit and watch these two sitting and pretending not to be, pretending to be versions of themselves all day. Perhaps you'll indulge me in another clip of them indulging themselves in some funny voices. I don't want to bury you, Batman. I will not put you in the ground in a little box. I will not do it, Master Bruce. I will not do it. I'm not going to bury another Batman. Another Batman? How many Batmans has he been burying? How many are there? I've buried 14 Batmans I've buried so far. 14 Batmans. And a little pointy ears I'm in the box. I'm not going to bury another nylon cloak. The sound of Verdi takes us back to England for a second run of Morse prequel Endeavour, set in Oxford, shot in Oxford, literally at the end of series one for the detective himself. <laughs> It's hard to remember a time when Sean Evans wasn't Morse, so comfortably have his young shoulders supported the old head of the character. The supporting cast are bedded in now too. Stomach contents. The full English. About an hour before he puts Sir Isaac's law of universal gravitation to the test. Scene-stealing pathologist Max de Brin, played with clipped glee by James Bradshaw, whom the discerning will remember as Gordon in The Grimleys. Meanwhile, the formidable Roger Allen may have found a part to eclipse Peter Mannion in the thick of it, in the avuncular, ready-robbed D.I. Fred Thursday. I wondered if it might be Friday at all. Well, there's a young girl who's gone missing, from Wantage. Frida Yelland. I thought rather than Friday, it could be Frida Y, couldn't it? Or it could just be Friday. The 60s may be swinging out there somewhere in the world, but Endeavour lurks in a dark place on the edge of town. You can see why Christopher Nyholm, principal director on series one and two of The Killing, chose this opening episode as his first English language job. This jolly carnival parade was never going to go off without incident. <laughs> say shot in Oxford. This was a bit of a shock too. Morse. Why don't they just rename him Norse? I'm definitely theoretically pro the scandification of British drama. We've chased Americans for long enough. A few more grey skies and a bit more haunted ennui could be just the cure we're looking for. Oh. Bad. There's even angst in the BBC Natural History Unit's latest bulletin from the animal kingdom, Monkey Planet, on BBC One. And it's not as harmonious as you might think. You need to make friends. <coughs> Avoid your enemies. Look at that. And find your place on the social ladder. Presented by a jolly Captain Birdseye figure called George McGavin, Monkey Planet seems a nature documentary for our time. Hey, hey, there's some monkeys monkeying around, being all human. These aren't captive animals trained to do tricks. They're free-living orangutans who've adopted an unusual way of life. 
spirit of David Attenborough, George saw his equivalent of guerrillas and got in amidst. Although, unlike Lord Sir David, he surrendered his dignity for some now obligatory stunt links. Like stripping pointlessly off in the snow for a thermographic camera just to prove that it was cold. Eventually, I would enter a coma from which I would never wake up. I would have been happy if he'd kept his outdoor gear on and just told us this about Japanese macaques. A single monkey would freeze to death out here, but by huddling, the macaques form a giant super monkey, one so big that it creates a microclimate of its own. Can't believe he didn't make the Arctic monkeys gag. To finish, a truly terrifying karaoke rendition of Let's Dance on The Voice, whose very awfulness rendered the Gogglebox viewers on Channel 4 speechless, and thus provides your moment of zen. If you say hi.